was like, oh. it was so insane. <laughs> and we're live. Oh. Hello. Hey guys, episode Welcome 15. To Number 15. Number 15? Yeah. Yeah. 15. yeah, we just checked. So Crazy. Oh, it is. Okay, wow. Uh, arbitrary. Welcome back to the show, now. Shane. Hey, thanks for having back. me, guys. <laughs> Let me back. You. We missed you. What, what's the episode in French, boys? Come on, here. Test your French. Uh, 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 no, no, no. Canes. Isn't it? Canes says the set this week. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. And what's, what's uh, Tuesday in, in French? Dimanche is Monday. Lundi, you know that. Monday, Mardi. Mardi. Mardi? No. Lundi, Mardi. 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 There you go. Mercredi, wow. We just all flunked. We all flunked out of French, yeah, 10th grade French, right exactly. there. Oh, my uh, French on my hotel bed on the road. Oh, yeah, because you were on the, on the road. That's right, yeah. Yeah, Corey was a child. He was a child star. He was the yeah. Macaulay Culkin of country music <laughs> on the road. How much French did you learn, Corey? How much French did you learn? Um, well, it was a subject I took. You know, in my school okay. studies on the road. So, yeah. you know, it's a great tool, but I, I was terrible. It was terrible. I never I, quite grasped it either. I, I think we all kind of take it. You didn't have to take it. Oh, uh, really? Now you're, you're required. I think you have to have five credits or something, right? Of an, yeah. I wish we were Spanish, guys. I don't know if you agree, because we all live in the States now, and it's like, we really can't use French. Yeah. Well, I always say how, fu how embarrassing it is when you go to, the, to Europe and – Everybody speaks at least three languages. Like, it's bananas. Like, you go in there and mumble through some terrible German, and they just look at you and go, I got you. Don't worry about it. Let's talk English. Yeah. If you ever use the Google Translate now, you can actually have conversational yeah. translations, Thank which is know. amazing. Does it do Klingon? Uh, not yet. How about Bachi? Do you speak Bachi? <laughs> I, need a, I need a droid that speaks Bachi. <laughs> yeah, th those apps are killing every possible uh, secondary language school, you know, because now right. yeah, like, who's going to bother? But like text, texting, texting, yeah, totally. and texting, and and even writing emails has killed like cursive. Our grammar's all getting jacked up. Like you know, I used to be really like nerdy about grammar and, and English, and I'm starting to kind of lose. Like, do I put the comma here, or is there a semicolon? I'm like, ah, <laughs> no one cares. And but now, write, it's like, lol, and move on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So was everybody? Did anybody? Uh, well, did anybody catch the uh, the Saturn opposition last night? I caught it. I via Corey Churko. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. I, I, I always see it better a better quality version of it through you rather than actually because so, you actually a telescope, right? Yeah. And so I, all I do is I take my cell phone and I literally hold it over the eyepiece until. And it just, I have to hold my breath because it's just, you miss it. And I just keep my thumb going at all times. And Wait, that's how you do that. That's how I do it. Yeah. Just with my, uh, my cell phone. And it would be great if there was some kind of contraption that actually held it in place. That would be gotta, amazing. Do they make some sort of telescopic lens for uh, your smartphone, as it were? Uh, <laughs> just by a camera. There's really. probably all kinds of attachments. Yeah. Yeah. But last night it was the Saturn opposition. So what that means is, if you stood and looked up at Saturn and you drew a line from Saturn through you and kept the line going, it would hit the sun. It's when the sun and Saturn are exactly opposite each other with Earth in the middle, right? Crazy. And so what, what that does is it makes Saturn appear even more bright because you're getting the reflections straight back rather than seeing shadows that make it look a little grayer. Crazy. Well, let me ask you this, just like purely scientifically. Is Saturn also flat? And discuss. Flat Earth, right? It's like a stencil that floats across. Sure. And, and just enough. because I'm completely Why, out of the loop, what was this comet you were looking for? I'm sure it's worldwide news, but I've just had oh, my head oh, raised down, apparently. You can still see it. It's On the 22nd, it's the closest it'll be to Earth. Really? Which is... 80 million miles or something like that, 90 million miles. Uh, it's called uh, NEOWISE, and it, it's an acronym that stands for Near Earth Orbit something or other, satellite, I don't know, maybe not. Might not have anything to do with that. that Stay is on target. Stay I, on target. I climbed up, uh, there's a mountain, like the mountain range just south of me here. I climbed up there the other night at like 1030, and I had an awesome view of the comet. Did you see it? Oh, wow. Yeah. 
yeah. had binoculars on it so I could see it pretty clearly. So I, you should do it, you guys, if that those of you who haven't, because it won't come for another 7,000 years. So I'll catch pretty, it then. Yeah. I'll just catch it then. Uh, Corey, <laughs> did, you know, did you know that you can see Pluto? Like, Pluto is lined up, too, between Saturn and Jupiter right yeah. now. Yeah, right behind Jupiter. But I don't think you can see it, can you? Yeah, I think you need a pretty serious telescope. Yeah, like, there's no way I could see it with my telescope. Nope. You can see this. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So they're pretty flat. Mm -hmm. just yeah, just I also, my nope. neighbor gave me this. Ooh, uh, I've been geeking out on this. It's stars all. and planets. Is that a book? I couldn't yeah, find out. Yeah, okay. book. Oh, okay, yeah, nice. How can, you read, can you read a, an entire chapter to us right now? <laughs> well, we got to kill some time here. <laughs> Crazy though, how much info see, is in there? It'd be like an Andy Kaufman bit where we're testing the audience to see who well, will actually stick actually, around. That's actually a good segue because speaking of stars, <laughs> we've got somebody uh, on deck here. We do so, have yeah. a star. That's right. Um, Todd, you maybe want to uh, you want to do the intro? I do. I, I I'm very excited. Uh, I I the very first time I snuck, I told this story on uh, Facebook earlier today and, and Instagram. But as a, like a 14 year old kid, it was I was desperate to see rock and roll and, and to see. I'd seen bands that, like, back then we'd have bands come play at high school dances and stuff like that. But seeing an actual rock and roll band live, I think I might have gone to see um, Loverboy and Brian Adams opening, by the way, in a, in a concert. But I wanted to be in a rock club. And the A4 in Saskatoon, which was the big city by me, was like um, was like the place to go. Everybody played there. I didn't realize how legendary it was until later on, but... We snuck into this bar by sneaking. I mean, I was six foot four already and like dorky looking Joey Ramone looking cat. Like, OK. And back then, our ID, this is going to be a very long story. I'm sorry. Our ID back then didn't have a photo on it. So as long as it said like, you know, John Smith, you know, and it just kind of went like and if they didn't ask you any further questions like. What's your star sign? Which always got you. Uh, Sagittarius, <laughs> you're out of here. Uh, uh, you could just walk right in. So uh, we went in and I, and I, and I caught this band. Uh, it was the first real sort of club experience watching a rock band. And I've seen them multiple times. We've gotten to become friends. And we, I still admire this man beyond anybody. So he played in the Pumps, which were a legendary Canadian group. He Orphan was the band that I saw uh, multiple times, and now he plays in Harlequin, so it's like he's a legend, a Canadian legend. Was that a long enough intro? Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Chris Burke Daphne. Yeah, Chris. Gosh, thanks for having me, fellas. Hi. Yeah, I, I was, uh, that seemed more about me than it was about you, but either way. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm, yeah. I'm really glad Bill Henderson canceled and you guys uh, got me in here today. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sitting uh, on deck. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're like the you're like the backup guy, always ready to go. <laughs> we got you a took beeper, just goes off in case we need you. Yeah. And I was gonna say I didn't realize until I read your bio today, which I should have known this because it's it's fascinating to me because I grew up in Lynn Lake, Manitoba, and you were born in Lynn Lake, Manitoba. I did not know that either. That place has got a lot of um, you know. Tom uh, Cochran. Tom Cochran was rock born. stars coming from there. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I wasn't born there. I was born in Saskatchewan, then I returned to Saskatchewan. But my, both my brothers were born in Lynn Lake, Manitoba. So it's really bizarre. How how what what how old were you when you left? One. I don't remember oh, okay. anything, so you were, anything about it. But uh, was the family my, there for the mine or something like that? There was like a mining. Yeah, my town. dad actually. My dad. I, my dad's a geologist. Uh, the the family joke is we're both in the rock business. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah so he ran the mine up there and the other family joke is my sister always says i slept with tom cochran uh, we were only one we were one year old at the time but uh <laughs> so, yeah then, like, it'd be interesting to see when was the last time you were there have you ever Dude, been back there? i'm gonna send you a video because um it's funny because just randomly one day i went on youtube and just put in lynn lake and there's some guy with a dash cam that doom, that doom, doom, get, get, den, playing like uh, life is a highway on a steady, you know, you want to murder your family kind of loop eventually. But 
but he spends about a half an hour driving through Lynn Lake, which is unfortunately largely abandoned because the mine closed down in yeah. 80, 81, maybe somewhere <laughs> in the early eighties. And, uh, but it's fascinating. And anybody I know that I've sort of, one day this guy walks up to me on the kiss cruise, me and Fitz are playing on the kiss cruise. And this guy goes, Todd Kearns, right? I go, yeah. Darren Tibbetts, Lynn Lake, Manitoba. I go, get the hell out of here, dude. <laughs> He's the guy that played me like, you know, metal gods from like <laughs> Judas Priest or something. So it's like this bizarre chunk of my life where at like 13, we moved away and I've never been back. But, I, but I've managed to find guys from up in that area. But I'll send you the video. I'll, I mean, it won't mean anything to you because you were one. You know. mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. Well, it'd be interesting to, uh, yeah, to go back. But uh, yeah, I think it's all closed down. But yeah, it's really uh, a coincidence that uh, so many people. I've actually I ran into some other guy at the rink the other day uh, that uh, his family were from Lynn Lake too. So crazy. Any idea? I didn't, think, I didn't think there was more than forty five people uh, there at. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Apparently, it's, it's up there too. It's super far north. But the funny thing is, when you actually look at Canada, it doesn't look far north at all. But in reality, it's like you know as yeah. far as north as you want to possibly be. But. Um, at its peak, apparently it was like 3000 people, which I was fascinated by. Cause I was like, what? It always seemed like it was like a 1500 people, maybe at most when I was there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we, uh, so then you, where your family took you to Winnipeg, I assume at that point. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, we moved to Winnipeg. Yeah. And you've Winnipeg. been there and that's been sort of home base. Yeah. What a great, what a great place to be though. I mean, like, as we know, all the years that we've spent hovering in and around the Winnipeg area. Why are there so many musicians? I guess because it's so fucking cold. You can either go outside to play hockey or stay inside and play rock and roll. Is that largely what happens, I assume? That's the theory. Uh, That is the theory. Uh, Brent would know as well as I do, although Brent uh, took off what what you were, what, 25 or something? But but you and I, uh, well, even though we were very near and dear to our our Winnipeg, but you've... You're well traveled too. We we definitely have to talk about a lot of stuff. Even though you're still in Winnipeg, when I went to LA, you were the the most the other person I saw the most from Winnipeg when I was in LA when I first moved there. Yeah, hmm. I remember that. Yeah, boy, those were yeah it, yeah. I guess that was the mid '90s when I was doing Chantel's record. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and I I think it was you and uh, maybe Lenita Erickson who was from. I, well, I guess she's not from Winnipeg, but she was spent time here or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, you worked at the guitar center on sunset, right? Is that right? I worked across the street actually for another Canadian guy when I first got there. Okay. And, um, cause I was just setting up new roots, but, um, you know, he's basically an immigrant working for an immigrant. That's basically <laughs> what, what happened. But no, it was <laughs> yeah. because I was new guy in town. I didn't have lots of friends other than yes, Lenita, and I had just uh, hooked up with Bruce Kulik fairly early on. But Chris was my, because Chris was down. Well, I, I mean, we can definitely get into lots of good stuff with you, Chris, because you're like the Renaissance man. You've done so many things. We mentioned Orphan and Pumps, but there's a million things in between that you've been. been so well, yeah, you should mention that the Chantal we're talking about is Chantal Kraviazic, yeah. the amazing songwriter and, and, and uh and uh, I talked to her husband not that long ago. So next time we go to L.A., we're going to try and do some food. But, yeah, they uh, she went on to do amazing things. And you were involved. You found her, essentially, I mean, around Winnipeg, just a little piano playing gal writing songs, huh? Yeah, yeah. I met her, uh, and I was blown away with her. And uh, she actually was a fan of an orphan song and uh, said, are you got the, the guy that sings that song? And I was like, yeah. And she said, I really need help. I said, come to my house on Wednesday because I uh, I'd seen her play in the club, and mm. I was amazed. And uh, so we started writing songs, and uh, that was pretty life changing because um, I ended up managing her t- for three years as well. That's uh, right. Co-produced a record and uh, and wrote half of the record. And that's under these uh, rocks amazing. and stones. Yeah, and. Uh, we were, you know, that's back in the days when record companies threw a lot of money around, and so they, uh, they, 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 they flew us out to uh, Los Angeles, and that's where I hooked up with Brent uh, for the first time, and uh, it was pretty life changing. And I was like, wow, uh, I didn't make any money playing in bands all my life. All, <laughs> of, uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, this is this is how you actually make money: is not playing in a band, but. Uh, 
you know, doing everything else. Uh, and I haven't figured this one out yet, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, Chris, what was really cool was you were also there on your own, Merritt, as a songwriter, <laughs> and you basically were able to, to uh, because of, you know, and Chantel was definitely a new artist then, but she had lots of new stuff going on, but you yourself were doing a bunch of songwriting with, with songwriters in L.A., yeah, I got a publishing deal with Chrysalis in Los Angeles, so I spent a lot of time working in L.A. Uh, with a bunch of writers. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I really fell in love with L.A. Um, I was always always kind of like, should I move here or should I? Uh, uh, but uh, for, you know, personal reasons. Uh, those personal reasons are a divorce. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, well, and you do have one. I want to stay with my kids and uh, of course, yeah, uh, just go back and forth. So, but uh, yeah, so but it was really cool because Brent was there and Brent kind of you know showed me around, uh, took me on little tours, showed me where OJ killed his wife, you know, <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, all the important places to visit. But that was awesome having somebody because when I went down there, everybody that I was hanging around with was all. You know, people in the business, uh, people from, you know, the label or Chantel or for the, the producers, people I had to sort of be on my best behavior with uh, all the time. Right. Uh, and so having somebody else that I could, uh, you know, just hang out with and be a Winnipegger was, uh, that was cool. <laughs> I was really, really glad that uh, Brent was there. We drove around in, uh, I had a Chevy Cavalier, still had Manitoba plates. And, uh, but Chris, <laughs> I, I remember this, we actually put on. Uh, I think it was Star 98, one of the pop stations, was going to debut a Chantal song that you had co-wrote, and uh, we heard it like on the radio driving around L.A. Do you remember that? I do, yeah. So yeah. it might have been, I forget if it was Wayne or what song it was, but, uh, um, and then we also did a little hanging where I think Chantel did a, a little showcase, and, uh, you know, we went to one of her first shows down there, and, and, uh, I just was proud because we were just Winnipeggers and there was all this good stuff, you know, to your credit and to Chantel at the time. And, and, uh, cause you know, we're Winnipeggers, we're humble and, and down yeah. to earth. Oh, totally. Oh, totally. It was, a, it was an incredible culture shock for me. Uh, you know, you know, I played a lot in, in Canada with, with my, my bands and a little bit in the States, but all of a sudden you're thrown into this uh, big time, uh, you know, Peter Asher was a co-producer of the record, the guy who ran Apple Records and wow. met Linda Ronstadt. And, and so, you know, you know, that's who I was hanging around with, uh, you know, people like that. Uh, so, yeah, it was a culture shock. And Matt Wallace was also involved uh, and we became fast friends. Uh, producer, yeah. So, uh, yeah, man, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. So I, I want to, because um, we're all such huge pumps and orphans fans growing up you know in canada and those bands were and the music right guys are some of our favorite Absolutely. music of all time so to your credit i i want to know and I'm, i know everybody else does because some of the stories behind those pumps and orphan records are pretty important way before anything to do with Chantel and stuff but but um because the probably there's probably some good stories in there about recording at the hit factory in new york but what the the pumps records before that though, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, the yeah, pumps yeah, yeah. was the first one. Yeah, I want to know yeah, all seen, those albums. Did anybody see this? Have yeah. you seen this yet, Chris? Forty yeah, years. AC DC posted that yesterday, right? Yeah, forty years and two days ago, you guys, the pumps opened for AC DC. Yeah, a, a new up and coming group called AC DC. Yeah, <laughs> in Winnipeg. That's so awesome, dude! Like to see this and like to see it literally two days before we we're going to talk to you. I was like, you gotta be kidding me! That's amazing. So they yeah. would have been on. That's like back in black. That's the back in black tour. That right? was the huh? first uh, uh, Johnson uh, black, back in black. Yeah, we did. I think wow. we did three dates with them. Yeah. Wow. That's and cool. uh, oh yeah, that was that was life changing. Super oh, nice yeah. guys too. Came by after and uh, hung out with us and uh, let us turn it up as loud as we wanted it. Um, yeah, it was cool. So quickly to rewind, I, I don't mean to step on anybody here, but what I'm really curious about is. At what point do you decide to pick up a guitar, and how does that turn into bass, and how do you become a singer and a songwriter and all that kind of stuff? I assume, like anybody else, you... I mean, if you're like us, you saw Kiss. You, <laughs> you, you wanted to breathe fire. <laughs> you 
Jesus. Which God. obvious? No, I'm kidding. But you know, it's it's. I'm always fascinated by the idea of somebody just saw the Beatles and thought, yeah, I'm gonna try that because it it it's fascinating to think like, you know, one day. Lemmy said to us one time, which I always remember Lemmy saying to us, I remember before there was rock and roll. And I was like, what? I was like, that was the weirdest thing anybody had ever said. But he was like, no kidding. No kidding. And then one day it was like, how much is that doggy in the window? And the next day it was the Beatles and Elvis or whatever. And just everything changed, you know? So yeah. yeah. I well, assume I re- you found something. Yeah. I, I remember very well. I mean, I was the youngest of uh, seven kids. Yeah. And uh, so I, I was exposed to a lot of uh, my older Sisters and Brothers music, which was, uh, you know, the Supremes and the Beatles and uh, uh, stuff like that. But uh, our drummer, TNT, when I was in grade seven, played me a Jimi Hendrix record. Oh, yeah. and, and it was just like, poof, that's yeah. what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Because uh, I love the music. I love the attitude. I, and I thought he was just the, you know, this guy was so cool. He was the James Bond of rock and roll. He's and, still unparalleled, uh, really. Yeah. And so, um, so he was, Terry was already a drummer and he was like, well, you know, you should take up the guitar. And, uh, so my sister had a, a guitar that she won somewhere and I started playing it. But then we met Lou Petrovich, who is an incredible guitar player himself. And so I was like, there's no way I'm going to play guitar like that guy. So maybe I should just try bass. It's a little <laughs> easier. And, uh, so we had a little trio and we were rehearsing for you know looking for singers and uh i was like well i'll just sing it until we find somebody sure and we never did <laughs> you're still looking yeah still. <laughs> i appreciate uh, that though that's so cool i mean because the idea as a songwriter in la and doing the nashville thing were you largely uh writing on your own or as a group or how did that all kind of start to play out when you were younger uh, well, I, I was I never felt like I was a super musician like the guys in Tuke or anything like that. But uh, <laughs> well, uh, <some> of them. <laughs> uh, I was never one of those guys, uh, but I loved writing songs and I felt like I was pretty good at it. Um, mind you, I wasn't you know, I was good at a couple of things and terrible at, at other things. And uh, but fortunately, I got a publishing deal. And uh, when I was signed to Chrysalis, they sent me all over you know, to New York and to Nashville and everywhere. And I wrote with uh, hit songwriters uh, all the time. And so I learned a lot about songwriting. And um, and so I felt like that's what I wanted to pursue is just to be a writer and a producer. But uh, yeah, so uh, I never felt like I was the greatest singer. I don't I don't have a high voice like like Todd or, uh, you know, I, ne- I could never do I could never do that. But I always felt like, well, maybe I'm never going to be a great singer or a great uh, guitar player, but maybe I can be a great songwriter someday. Oh, so well. uh, still, still a work in progress. But uh, well, yeah, I mean, you know, hey, I think you've uh, I think you've achieved more and beyond that. Personally, I'm I'm interested to know how would they arrange? Like, you would go to Nashville and they would arrange like a meeting, and you, you would just get together with guitars and and write that way, or how did it? Work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Chrysalis had a, uh, you know, they had a roster of a bunch of writers. And so, uh, and like I said, back then there was, there was a lot more money. They were throwing a lot of money around. I got a six figure publishing deal Damn. Uh, and they would put me up at the, uh, Summerfield suites and, uh, on, uh, just off Santa Monica there. And, wow. uh, and, uh, yes, yeah, so, you know, a guy come over with guitars and we, we'd write songs, uh, oh, they made in New York and and and, and uh, put me up and you know put me get me writing with some of the people on their roster, uh, and then uh, later on uh, I started getting involved in country music and I spent a lot of time uh, writing in Nashville, which is a different ball game. That's more like punch the clock, as you guys know, mm-hmm. uh, right. and uh, uh, that's a different animal itself. That's a very um, uh, well, one guy said it perfectly to me. This guy, this publisher, uh, Clay Myers, he said to me, "Chris, you got to make it the same and completely different as everybody, every other. <laughs> it's got to be the same and different as every other hit song." And that was wow. so, you know. And that's that's not an easy thing to do. Not at all. No, that's crazy. But you're right because there's a style that's going on right now. So do that, but do your yeah. own thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But make it fresh. 
Yeah, but make it fresh. But the same. Like but that fresh. Song would make it make it fresh and brand new. <laughs> yes. Yeah, when you guys were writing, would you be in a studio recording the ideas, or how would that? How would it in actually? The early, in the earlier days, uh, no. You had, believe it or not, we had cassette decks, little portable cassette decks. Sure. Uh, in Nashville now, of course, there's a lot of track guys and stuff like that. So there's. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, uh, Nashville has gotten very much like LA now. It's it's all track guys. Uh, yeah. At every at every real right, at every published right. Okay, I want to yeah. know about New York. I got to know about recording in New York City because you have at the power station. Yeah, at the, that's it. The power station and um, Tony Bongiovi. When you mentioned yeah, that's... when you mentioned the song that Chantal liked. Uh, if nobody knows what that song is, and I and we all do, I would I would guess. Uh, well, it's the song Miracle, which is one of the greatest yeah. songs ever written that <laughs> we all love, but some of the rest of the people... Pull it off Tom Petty. But, yeah. but, but um, and you know what? I really, really, really like, and everyone should, should do it, uh, go to YouTube, and is where's the link? Where can someone go to hear the... You just recently... Um, cu you just released it again with Chantel and yourself, right? Duetting? Yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, we did a version uh, uh, about two months ago. Yeah, so, That's so um, cool. yeah, I put it up on YouTube. On on, uh, I think it's on. Uh, might might be a Chris Burke Gaffney channel or a Pumps and Orphan channel. I can't remember. I've got a few channels now, so uh, it's on one of those two, Chris Burke Gaffney or the Pumps and Orphan. But uh, uh, or if you just. If you just write Miracle featuring Chantel Kreviazic into YouTube, it may come up. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great song. It's, it's an amazing it's so song. So good, yeah. guys. And so, yeah. but would, would, uh, what, tell us a story about like being at the Hit Factory or uh, the power station. And because uh, there's got to be that Bon Jovi connection that, you know, because Tony Bon Jovi and John Bon Jovi, what's the stories? What's like, because he was not established yeah. yet, right? And you guys were recording there. Yeah, so we got we got our American deal with uh, uh, Portrait Records in the states, uh, which was uh, both Aldo Nova's uh, label and Lindy, uh, sorry, Cindy Lauper, wow. and oh, wow. so they they hired Tony Bon Jovi, and uh, he came, actually came to Winnipeg and saw us at the Norlander. Did you guys play the Norlander? Or is that yeah, before wow. your time? Of course, I remember it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he came to the Norlander and saw us, was that and Hagar's he came Rock back. Club? He said, "Hagar's Rock Club." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, you know, I think uh, I think that song with the doorbell, the doorbell song, that's a hit. That's a hit song. That doorbell song, cause it's got the ding, ding, ding. You know, uh, so anyway, we went, to, we went to the power station, which he owned. Uh, yeah. And uh, he was, he was a, honestly, he was a bit of a douchebag, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> he Let it all hang out, Chris. Let it all hang out. Let's yeah, he, he passed <laughs> us on to this other guy, Lance Quinn, and he came in every once in a while after he was – finished with his hookers or whatever uh <laughs> got, the, got the check on us but the interesting thing is that uh john bon jovi at the time uh had just won the philadelphia songwriting contest or something and he said oh yeah i should meet my uh my nephew um and uh i was like yeah sure uh so he, he came by and and john would come in and sweep up the studio in exchange for studio time at the time at at the wow. time mm, yeah. uh but he was a super nice guy i remember uh he was very outgoing and uh and and tony said well you guys should write a song together and i had this song called saved by the bell mm. uh, i had the idea and so john and i went back to his he had, I, he had this little apartment or something like that we got some soup somewhere and we went back and he's like okay so the lyrics got to be i hit her i hit it with a left punch and there was an upper hook a cut of uh, on my heart or something like that and i'm like i don't think so man I don't <laughs> <laughs> and so as it turns out i didn't use any of his lyrics didn't cut him in on the song and uh we recorded it it was terrible and uh in in retrospect i should have had his name on it there you go there you go He's didn't he didn't tony and john end up like it, like they're just like completely like at odds now. Like it just I've went. Heard, I've heard that. I've heard that, and I'm not surprised. Like I said, Tony was. Wow. Uh, yeah. He was a difficult that's, dude. Yeah. That's sad to hear because one of my most favorite albums ever was the Miko Star Wars uh, disco. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> right? Is that a Tony Bon Jovi song? And, and that was that was Tony Bon Jovi. Wow. 
Oh. Yeah, pr- producing. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's the disco. Uh, it's a disco version of the Star Wars soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> ridiculously <laughs> awesome. Anybody who spent any time with Ace me Ace has. Solo record too? Hmm? Did he not do the Ace Frehley solo record? That's for Kiss fans. I mean, he's done so many. Kiss, things. Kiss fans should right. chime in. Where's the uh, question? Well. It, Judge, you know, I mean, even the band Power Station, the Duran Duran spinoff, was named after the studio. But yeah, the Power Station yeah. has, a, has a lot of uh, history. So going back to the pumps, just because yeah, it's, it's if, getting... If there, was, if there was a Corey Churko quiz uh, for his top uh, 10 songs, I, I don't think I would have guessed that one. <laughs> <laughs> In particular, it's the Empire Strikes Back Miko version. <laughs> Well, actually, no way. Because I've played that so many times I as a, as a too, 12 year old. We're the same age. We were very influenced by the yeah. same stuff. And yes, yeah. yes, yes. I, I, I had it on 45. And, and if you go on YouTube, you can actually see the label of the of the 45. And it just took me right back to, oh my God, I, mm-hmm. I've looked at this so many times. Yeah. In, I, I, in a span from 12 to 13 years old. <laughs> I, I know Corey Churko, and I would have got that one right. I would have got that. that, that, that <laughs> There was a time when we were on the tour bus with Shania, and and we had Bluetooth uh, capabilities in in the, on the bus, and I would say, okay, guys, I'm going to bed, and and I'd I'd played the song for them earlier, so I'm going to bed now. I go to my bunk, and they continue listening to what they wanted to listen to, and I would continue <laughs> to hijack them with the song in the middle of them. They'd be like, go! <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, but going back to the pumps, it, when you guys started in the pumps, was it more like a, I mean, how how far out did the pumps play like uh, in the club days? Is it like it starts in a, in a place like Winnipeg? Is that like, is it like full weeks in Canada playing cover songs and then you build into an original band? Or did you guys kind of start as an original band with the intention of writing and recording your own stuff and then going that route? Or how did that all work? Well, uh, like I said before, I wasn't the greatest singer. And at that time... Uh, you know, it was Led Zeppelin and a lot of 80s guys that were singing super high, right? And so I couldn't, some of the only cover stuff I could do is, was the Cars or, or maybe Cheap Trick. I remember and, you guys, uh, and I remember Orphan doing, like one of my uh, most prized memories was sitting there watching you guys do um, I'm the Walrus by the Beatles. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Stevie really sang cool, it, yeah. Yeah, it was a really cool version, but yeah, I remember that. But yeah. go ahead. So you guys kind of didn't have to do like the standard. Well, no, we 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 did um, we did cover songs because you kind of had to to get started. But we did uh, probably over half original and That's just amazing. Uh, yeah. I mean, and part of the part of the motivation is because a lot of that stuff I couldn't sing anything. Uh, so we did a bunch of original songs and uh, yeah, we started out in the clubs and back then, um, you know. Uh, I, I hate saying back then because it makes me sound so freaking old. And uh, uh, but uh, there was uh, you had to bring in your own PA back then and I your own lights and stuff like that. They didn't have house. Uh, and so one of our, you know, I was like, well, we'll never be, you know, I'll never be able to sing like Kenny Shields or George or any of those guys. So we got to outdo them with the show. So we always had the best lights, our big lights and big PAs and stuff like that. And tried to, you know, dress like freaking clowns or pirates. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it seemed to work because uh, we started filling the clubs like crazy everywhere we went. And then, uh, yeah, then we got a record deal and, uh, uh, we got a lot of tours with, uh, you know, Prism and uh, all the whatever bands were happening. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Triumph. Uh, and we, we went coast to coast a few times. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so it's cool. In watching the documentary, which I, has anybody else seen? Fitz and I both watched the documentary together, which is great. But the transition from the pumps to the to Orphan, what's interesting to me is it's, I always kind of as a kid just thought, okay, well, it's the same kind of lineup bass player is a singer there's a guitar player keyboard player a drummer and it yeah. just kind of felt like it was kind of like well let's do that again but like like that didn't work or that's kind of run its course or whatever let's start this new thing was that like the conscious decision just to kind of go in a different direction or, or... no no it wasn't a conscious decision uh two of the guys uh left the band uh one of them ended up coming back tnt but lou left the right. band um i was I was devastated because I like Lou was probably more of a front man than I was. Uh, he was the, he was the real character on stage. Right. And, and a great guitar player and all that. Yeah. Kind of stuff. Uh, 
So I was kind of devastated, but Brent said, no, no, well, let's, let's carry on. Let's just find some new guys. Right. Uh, and so uh, there was a band called The Orphans who were playing bars in the sea. And uh, Stevie was uh, a very different guitar player, like completely different stylistically. But he had a great tone, you know, big, yeah. chunky uh, uh, Les Paul and, uh, and high watt uh, sound. And, uh, and so uh, we, we recruited him and uh, we were still called the Pumps for quite some time until we got our second record deal. We got a record deal with Sony or a CBS at the time. And... Uh, they insisted that we change the name, which I th actually oh, okay. think was a mistake. Uh, I never, I never really loved the name Orphan, and uh, I felt like we already had a following. I, it, it sounded very odd to me for them to want to change the name, but they felt like it sounded too new wave, right? It sounded like the Cars or the Clash or whatever, and I, I was like, well, whatever. That doesn't seem like a negative to me at, no. at the time. No, 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 was, no, not at all. But. Uh, but that's why we're not A&R guys, see? We don't make these creative decisions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then, uh, you know, we had, we had, they put out, uh, they, they made a video for Lonely at Night, which uh, at that time, video stations were just starting to explode. Totally. Uh, and, and then at the last second, this A&R guy went, no, I think it should be Saved by the Bell, the song I told you about that yeah. I didn't write with uh, John. Right. Uh, it's like, are you sure that song is terrible? Uh, <laughs> and it is, it's terrible. Uh, it's, I uh, always love that. Song. Song. I love it. I don't too. know if you ever had a song you recorded that you cringe at, but uh, that's one of them. Anyway, they decided to release that song, even though we had a video, and that, I think that really hurt us. No, oh. across the country, started playing. Amir and it went top ten in Canada, and it was That's never right. even released as a single. Uh, but thank God, uh, you know, some of the radio guys back then had a little power, and they didn't. It wasn't all about consultants and stuff like that. Well, the first time I saw Orphan was, of course, at the A4, and that that was I, I don't even remember if if there was a record out. But the next time I saw Orphan was at the Centennial Auditorium in Saskatoon opening for Platinum Blonde, which was like a yeah. Beatlemania moment, moment of like me and my brother and like a million screaming girls. <laughs> and, and you guys made such an impression again on me where it was like, oh, wow, these guys are like, they just seemed super tight, super pro. And it was something we saw in a lot of the Canadian bands was just that constantly playing, constantly playing clubs, constantly like just so when a band played, it wasn't sort of like, do I talk to the audience here? Do you know everybody seems to have it dialed in, and you guys seemed like you had it way more figured out than than a lot of bands for sure. Yeah, well, we did play a lot, and we had a few people in our our camp who, uh, you know, would give us some good constructive criticism about uh, how to move forward and uh, stuff like that. But yeah, Platinum Blonde, that was uh, that was uh, that was a crazy tour. Oh, I bet yeah. that was that was the uh, second album at that point, for, was it? Yeah, I think yeah. I think so. Yeah, salute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's uh, awesome too. So I'm gonna yeah. ask a uh, Chris Farley question here. <laughs> uh, Remember that time? How how many friends do you have now? If you had 17 when you wrote Lonely at Night, still the same 17. <laughs> <laughs> That's such an arbitrary number. I always wondered that. Like when I, whenever we sing that song, I got 17 friends. They'd all walk in. I was like, what an interesting like. Like I, I just imagine you sitting there stroking your stroking your beard, thinking like, should it be 15 friends? Should it be 20 friends? <laughs> I didn't have a beard back then, otherwise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I was thinking more metaphorically. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I know. Uh, it's all <laughs> about the syllables, uh, Todd. True. I had three syllables. <laughs> 17 friends. There you go. Four yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Yep, there's a reason for everything. Dude, I played yeah. that song. I played that song back then as a cover song. When we were kids, we played yeah. that at high school dances. We played that. It was as well received as Summer of 69 and, you know, The yeah. Immigrant Song or whatever else we were well, playing. I, I was totally uh, blown away and flattered when you guys uh, put it on your record uh, along with, uh, you know, so many bands from Canada that were way bigger than us so uh, I'm, I'm grateful and uh, and flattered and uh, the only the only thing that pissed me off is it sounded way better than our own <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that 
Get out of my head. It's just supposed to be a fresh coat of paint. That's the way I think I yeah. always assess it. Is you know, it's yeah. our favorite songs now, just with a re-recording. I can't believe how true to uh, true to the original you guys did, and uh, the, the production's great. And yeah, it's it's awesome. It's killer. As as, as Ralph well, James says, we even learn the mistakes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's such an <laughs> help. So, so before uh, I'm curious about what you guys are doing. Like, what uh, what's what's the future for Took? Uh, well, I, I, this is I'm pretty much you retired. Guys, you guys have you guys have original music out now, right? Mm -hmm. I heard a song, at least one song. You have one song. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah that seems like, that seems like enough, doesn't it? That's all we Get need. Facts, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got you guys are gonna you guys are gonna take over the world, uh, and uh, with Canada on the name of your back, uh, I freaking love it. So yeah, oh. you're gonna need a couple more. Yeah, we'll and probably need a couple. Yeah. I'm here for you to write with you if you need it. <laughs> that would be great. It'd that be sounds nice. like a great idea. That is a great idea. Yeah. We'd love to do that. Uh, yeah. A skilled uh, craftsman behind us for sure. Would, yeah. would you be good? Would you guys uh, allow uh, an outside writer to? Come and uh, hang with you guys. Of course. Absolutely. Of course. Sure. Of course. Okay. Yeah. They're working okay. on this new lyric with this right hook. It's really going to kill you. It's going to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be huge. And you're to blame. <laughs> it's going to be a knockout. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's shot to the heart, and you're to blame. You give love a bad. Yeah. He actually went on to do something with that. Wow. That, yeah. That kid's got a real future. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't count him out. I got a I got a great question here for Chris. So, how do you fit Burt Gaffney on the back of a hockey jersey? Good one. Uh, well, um, remember when we did the the Jets thing uh, last uh, year? We did the playoff thing. I don't remember that. They at did all. manage to get it there. Uh, <laughs> they did manage to get it on there. Yeah, it's long. I guess it has to be a little bit smaller. So I think Ryan Nugent Hopkins and you are the you're the only two people I've seen with hyphenated last names on a on a hockey jersey. Right. Hey. Yeah. The Nuge. Right. Right. Nuge. I, I'm just curious. Yeah. Is that because both? I'm always curious. I never have asked you. You have Burke Gaffney as your last name and hyphenated. Yeah. Name, yeah. What's the etymology of that? Uh, it happened back in Ireland somewhere. Uh. It's not that exciting a story. I think uh, I think there was a Bridget Burke who was an actress or something like that and didn't want to give up her name or something like that. Okay. But it happened a long time ago. It wasn't there's a lot of hyphenations now. Uh, this happened probably in the 1800s. Wow. I think. Hmm. I appreciate the idea that someone like Sting or Cher just went down to one name and you're like, I'm doing three. <laughs> <laughs> you should yeah. have had it, your middle initial in there as well to really yeah make really a stretch it out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of other names, have you guys uh, have you guys heard Bucky Cromwell yet? Well, uh, yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, but we want you to tell us. Who who's this Bucky Cromwell? Tell us all about. Well, I wanted to put a record out, but um, I uh, and I wanted it to be something that was branded really strong and really had a powerful brand, because like Tuke, I wanted to have you know have marketing ideas and make this guy unreal and like a superhero and stuff like that and I was like well that's definitely not me so uh, <laughs> I'll just make up another name and so um, I uh, and also wanted to you know I'm really I don't know if it's afraid or uh, fascinated by American politics and what's going on in the world and stuff like that and the environment and uh, so I has wanted there, to has there been stuff going on I'm, I'm like I don't pay a lot of attention, so just kidding. Go ahead. You're, you're like my wife. She doesn't want to know anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, she doesn't want to know. And that's probably smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sleep better at night, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's probably smart. So uh, so I went, I, I looked. To, I wanted to look for a name that was very searchable, that if you put Bucky Cromwell, there was nobody else. So True. I found this guy, Bucky Cromwell, and the only Bucky Cromwell I could find was a plumber in Wisconsin. Ah. <laughs> and, and so I felt like, okay, I don't, ha I don't really have any competition on the Bucky Cromwell name. And uh, so it's a work in progress, uh, but uh, I'm having a lot of fun with it. And uh, I hope you guys uh, will, uh, you know. We're gonna have Bucky's back. What, 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 kind, of, for what kind of music is it? Is it staying true to what you've been doing, or is this kind of your Chris Gaines kind of thing? Is it a no? Well, that, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, the Pete, Chris Gaines thing, that hurts. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not insinuating well, that. It's. I'm just wondering, is it something that, is it a different style of music altogether, or is it just going under kind of a alter ego? Yeah, it's more It's more pop. I, uh, you know, I don't I don't listen to classic rock that much anymore, or, or you know, I, uh, I'm... I, I listen to more I, as a producer. I, I like making beats and I like, uh, you know, I, I listen to Justin Bieber and st shit like that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and uh, and not that Mikey Cromwell is like Justin Bieber. He's kind of halfway between maybe, you know, he's more like something like, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, Imagine Dragons or or cool. or, uh, oh, interesting. Or, or something like that, although. I only have a couple songs out uh, that are live right now. I've got a bunch ready uh, that are coming out, and I'm—it's all do it yourself. I don't have any funding for it. There's no Factor or Manitoba Film and Music because I'm—I'm I'm attacking a lot of politicians, so I can't oh. get funding. Uh, uh, but I, my idea was also—I I was thinking to myself, you know, if fake news can put Donald Trump in the White House. Then maybe it could make Bucky Cromwell a rock star. And so, <laughs> you never know. Yeah. You know? And so and so I was thinking, yeah, I'll just I'll just say, well, Bucky Cromwell denies that he's Kim Kardashian, the father of their child, or <laughs> it's on the FBI wanted list. Just make up a bunch of you know, it's sad <laughs> and have some fun with it. And uh, so that's my intention. And uh, uh, well, that's the best thing about it, because if Bucky Cromwell gets caught in a limousine with some hookers, that's not your problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And you're like that, honey. That wasn't me. That was Bucky Crow. Plausible deniability. Into that to be one of the episodes. It's funny you say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is genius. Why haven't I thought of this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Darren, uh, are you in? Are you are you going to be working for Bucky Cromwell now on the marketing? Uh... I think you should. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know you it. Jump I mean, in. Yeah, if you want to make. He's probably already got ideas going. That's oh yeah, this is, is how I work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's he's why he's silent right now. He's probably selling stuff out the back of his house. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, know, I know you don't want to cheat on Tube. I know you don't want to cheat on Tube. But if you get any ideas, follow me. If you just get any ideas, let me know. Oh yeah, I mean, I, hey, that's great. He'll go anywhere for a sandwich. So yeah. exactly. <laughs> hey, Corey. So <laughs> Corey, I got. Here's an interesting twist. So if it was so, Bucky Cromwell is responsible for. Here, here's a whole line of dot connecting. So the early days of Chris's success with writing great songs in The Pumps and Orphan, which turns into opportunities as a songwriter and developing other artists like Chantel. But Chantel, as a prolific songwriter, also wrote for other artists. And you, playing with Kelly Clarkson, Corey, have played the song Walk Away that Chantel yes. wrote. So yes. you've actually that like oh. how how full circle does that come? So, you know, it's true. Chris's influences have <clears throat> yeah. bled right into, you know, a Kelly Clarkson career in some some shape or form. So there you go. Yeah, I was going to ask if you were around during that that period when she actually got because there's there's a second song on that album too, and I can't remember the name of it, but I played it. It was on my first Kelly Clarkson tour, and I, I actually played a huge string line on this song, which was very involved but uh yeah so no, I, was, I was kicked to the curb by that time oh. <laughs> uh, the best no, uh, no i wasn't uh, i wasn't around at that time but i'll tell you an intro you you may know this uh i did uh develop and manage and produce a guy named kyle Riebko, right. a kid from 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 Saskatchewan. yeah really talented uh a really big record deal with Columbia Records. We got him a big record deal and a big publishing deal. And so we recorded. We went back and I hooked up with Matt Wallace again. And we produced his record in L.A. And he was only 15 at the time. And he hadn't finished his high school. And he had to take his high school online. But it had to be with, I think, it can, I don't know how it worked, with a Canadian or something. And so we went to your brother's house. And did he ever tell you that? Uh, he might have, but I don't remember. Yeah, when he lived in L.A. So me and Kyle went to his house, and Kyle wrote the exam because it had to be overseen by somebody else, uh, possibly a Canadian in, in, in the United States or something like that. And What, so uh, Kevin Churko's qualified to be... <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. That's a so Cana like, Canadian, Canadian laws, kids, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hung out for like three or four hours and uh, at his place. and uh, Oh, wow. And that was in, in L.A., in West Hills. Yeah. He was only here for a very short time, so yeah, that's pretty. Yeah. That's really cool. Wow. Yeah. The world gets wow. smaller. Fascinating. What year was that? 
Uh, that would have been around 2000, 2001, somewhere around there. Crazy. Hey, Chris, we never... Uh, I, I, I used to run into him a lot at uh, the Country Music Awards, too. Uh, right. Because he, he, he did a bunch of country records, or still is, I guess, eh? Yes, exactly. Yeah. He pretended you didn't know me, but... Uh... Uh, he, he tried to ghost you? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. to be honest, he's the reason why I was so into Orphan back in the day. Because oh, yeah. I don't know how he got turned on to you guys, but uh, we were still playing with the family band touring Ontario. And I remember just looking at the album covers actually, uh, in the really bad band houses in Ontario and just listening to Lonely at Night and Miracle. and the A4 band house, though. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, yeah. I'm sure we could all write books on the band houses we, yeah. we played in yeah. Yeah. or stayed in. Absolutely. Mm. Or the Windsor and Red Deer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. totally. ahead, For me, I, I just lived down the road, so I would, whenever we played the Windsor, I would just drive home. Well done. Oh, yeah, right. Where, Where are you from, we... Shane? Innisfail, Alberta, like an hour okay. north of Calgary. And South how did you hook up with these guys? We've I mean, known each other since then. Back yeah, I've known these guys since like back when we used to tour, you know, back in the late 80s. <clears throat> so you played in Canadian bands as well? Yeah. Gene was the first guy we knew that ran off to Los Angeles and became a rock star. We're like, oh, what? okay. He's playing with Ingvay Malmsteen? What? I was like, yeah, I left, I left when I, in 86 and I moved to Calgary and I started playing in bands. And, and then probably a couple of years after that, that's when I used to bump into these guys. Yeah, he was right. in a band. He was in a well. He played an ACDC tribute and a bunch of stuff. So he was, he had, uh, yeah, he played. And it, it was. I like. I like was, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say I like Shane's story about when he played with Nirvana. That's a good story. <laughs> uh, oh, that's right. In Victoria, Canada. Yeah. Have we told that story on here because that's a good story. Uh, you should tell us. Okay. I mean, well, we are. I was playing with Hell's Bells, the ACDC tribute band, and we were in Victoria. And we ended up opening for Nirvana one day. <laughs> and basically, it was like just another day where there was another band coming in. We're like grumbling. It was like midweek. Who's coming in? And we have to strike the stage. What, what's going on? Like we were the headliners this week, we thought, you know. Because they'd always sometimes throw a curveball into the middle. Yeah, of the I know that one. I know that yeah, one like one. a band like Orphan or someone would come in there and well, just overtake your show. Yeah. <laughs> we never really heard of the band Nirvana at all. It was like, what? They're from Seattle? So... Or that's as they're really, called in Canada, Nirvana. Yeah, Nirvana. <laughs> they pulled up in their van, their white van. But we were like down there in the middle of the day, and they pulled up, and they had like a you know a Ford, like a '70s Ford Econoline line with a you know, <laughs> trailer, and this. They started pulling out their gear, and I was like, "What's the deal with all this, this old gear?" And the, what's the deal with this all this hype about Nirvana anyway? Um, uh, that they they did their sound check, and then. I, I, I caught a little bit of it, and then it was at the end of the sound check, and I was going to the elevator, and, and Kurt Cobain. I just pressed it. I was going to press a button, and the the door was still open, and Kurt Cobain kind of turns around, and I just walk in. And he's got his like lumberjack, you know, coat on, and I, I walked in, and I tried to make a motion to talk to him. I was like, hey. one of those. <laughs> what did, you, did you know? Did, were you aware of Nirvana at the time? Not at all. No, it was before they broke. And he just kind of looked ahead at the, the elevator and the buttons on the. He just didn't even glance at me and then pressed the button. Went up a couple floors. He got out. I was like, that was really strange. He didn't even engage me or anything. So I was curious to see what would happen that night. Anyway, we went, long story short, went down. We played the, I think, like two songs into our set. And, uh, they started throwing stuff at us, <laughs> hitting on, on us, on Jeff, Jeff, our singer. He, he made the mistake, like, telling everybody to F off, and everything, and it just got really ugly. And we had to Who, had who, to bail. who was throwing stuff at you, the band or, van, or the crowd? Oh, no, the crowd. <laughs> it'd be it better, was, it'd be like, like, it's a better story if your boss yeah. is throwing things yeah. at you. Uh, you, you, guys had all, you guys had all back combed hair and yeah, like spandex so and shit. I and... Should probably, I should probably mention that. So after I rode up with Kurt and I realized you know, he, he wasn't you know, so friendly to me or whatever, probably because I had you know, long hair and I just looked like <laughs> a girly boy. <laughs> um, and I went in and I talked to Jeff, our singer. I said, dude, I think we should just kind of like you know, go out and maybe – you know, play a couple of our original songs and just keep it heavy. Maybe an ACDC song. He goes, 
no, we're going to we're going to do our thing. And so we came out and it was like all the glam stuff. And I, I told, you know, maybe we should dress it down a little bit. Just go like jeans and, you know, just kind of plain it up a little bit because they, they look like, you know, it's a little bit different vibe than what we, we do. And it was like right when the grunge thing started to take off. So everybody's, you know, baseball caps and just like, you know, and you guys said, yeah, no way, we're sticking it's... with the assless chaps. We're going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not the really assless chaps, but he had like the full spandex like cape. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and his hair like was extra teased. Oh. Fuck it, let's fucking give it to him, guys. I was like, oh, this isn't going to be good. So sure enough, after two songs, they started like hawking loogies at us. That was the only time I've ever actually witness people spitting like fully spitting at us is that a <laughs> is that a canadian term haka i mean we all know Haka-lugi. what it means but i don't know for sure if, if it's it's yeah. jeff jeff lost his temper on the mic and he's like fuck you guys motherfucker. <laughs> and we ended it we got off the stage and then later after that all that shenanigans was over i went down to catch their set and i was freaking blown away i mean they just completely yeah. blew my mind was Dave Grohl in the band at that point? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So okay, and that, that kids was the exact day that grunge took over the world and glam metal was exactly. no more. Yeah. 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 And Shane it's, went upstairs and like, combed his hair down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I did. I went upstairs, put a put a cap on, put my lumberjack because I had a lumberjack coat. Went back down and I fit right in. I think, my they, I think they call that the uh, the Innisfail dinner jacket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I knew it was like. I was like, yeah, it's it's all going to change. And it was like two months after that, it never mind came out and just blew. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that's such a fascinating story because in Canada, for some reason, they would do that. You'd be playing like a week long gig and then Wednesday, Street Heart or, you know, some band was going to come in and play that night. So you'd have to strike your gear. They You'd open for them and then they would just be gone the next day and you'd, you'd do the rest of the week. But that happened a lot. But I never heard of Nirvana doing that. That's such a fascinating. Hey, Chris. I looked it up. Right around that time, you must have been doing Deadbeat Honeymooners. Yeah, similar story. Uh, we, yeah, we... Uh, right, because that would have been right, like around the grunge. Came up right yeah. when grunge was exploding, and so... Uh, and it was, it, was, it was a total rock record, like a bluesy rock uh, thing. And uh, so we have a joke about the Deadbeat Hunter, which was the fastest charting record of all time. Straight down. <laughs> <laughs> but not well, not for lack of good music, but I think like, you know, Shane's story is that Nirvana really changed uh, an entire yeah. genre of music and everybody oh, was putting yeah. good music out. It just wasn't, you know, it just kind of took a little side note from, because you could probably go mm-hmm. back to that record and go, well, that was a great record. It's just that Nirvana was really creating that stir that all those bands. Yeah, had. yeah. Anything, anything that stood for, you know, whatever, you know, rock and lo- uh, uh, long hair. Or, no, I wouldn't, shouldn't say long hair, but whatever the difference between rock and grunge is. Anything that was still, that looked like rock was so passe. that mm. uh, Yeah. And that uh, happens. I mean, it's funny to think about it because we all lived through it. But I think that that, you know, that shift happens quite often in music, whether it was disco or anything else back in the day where something was cool on Monday and is not cool by Friday. <laughs> it's like it's kind of like, oh, okay, things are changing. And you either learn to kind of roll with it or you kind of get out of the way. So Chris was... The, the, dead oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, did, speaking of Deadbeat Honeymooners, um, talking about playing for famous bands and opening for famous bands, the GNR uh, opening slot in Winnipeg, was that somebody that you knew through their camp or was that the, the record company trying to push the record at that point? You mean how did we get on that show? Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess it was the usual. I don't remember exactly the agents, uh, labels. Uh, uh, yeah, something like that. What, what year uh, is this? What year was the Guns N' Roses show? Uh, it probably was. Uh, gosh. Uh, Are we talking Use Your Illusions and, and that whole thing? Um, well, it was at the at their peak. It was yeah. at their peak, but I can't remember. Uh, the thing I remember most about it is my son, who was uh, 14 or something at the time. And 14 is when you seem to be the most impressionable as uh, by music. Sure. And his favorite band was Guns N' Roses. So when we went to the sound check, he got to 
go hang out in their dressing room and see all the amplifiers and go on stage. And that's really what I, I, I remember about it most. But, I mean, you guys play with Slash every freaking night. It's uh, Actually, everybody here has played with him, except yeah. Darren. We're trying to get Darren a gig, though. Yeah. <laughs> actually, funny funny uh, story, because I think it is actually to the day, 1987, uh, Appetite for Destruction came out. That's right. Oh, wow. It's, it's 34 years ago today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I always yeah. said that, that that album was kind of the transition in, into the grunge. Yeah. Because even Axel had the big hair and then it yeah. went flat. And yeah. And actually, before uh, we forget, we should make mention that uh, three years to the day uh, is when we lost Kenny, who uh, that's obviously right. we should uh, oh, wow. never Shield, forget. That's right, yeah. yeah. No. Nope. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, uh, that was a heavy day. I mean, it's, that's another guy who, uh, you know, that whole Canadian scene and the whole prairie scene had such an effect on too, which is obvious yeah. for those that don't yeah. know, we've done, you know, two songs on, on each of the records, one song on each record has a street heart song and one orphan song. So that's been an ongoing conversation too. Chris, if you could choose a Canadian song or a Canadian band for us to cover, what would it be? I'm always wondering. Oh, uh, that's a really good question. I might need a little time to think. I about know. It. Take take your time as we kind of ramble <laughs> on, because people. It's funny. Like somebody will say something like uh, "Cinnamon Girl" by Neil Young, or someone will, you know, something fairly obvious. And once in a while, someone will pull something like way out of the left field, and I'll be like, "Oh, damn! I totally forgot well, that." It, it, it kind of has to be pretty well known, right? It, that's not necessarily. Cool. I mean, we we kind of uh, you know we we kind of feel like we tried to not necessarily dig deep, because I mean, for for Prairie guys, a lot of the music that we that we cover it was sort of uh it was fairly obvious to us but um well, it's safe to say, it's safe to say that i would say 50 percent of your audience every song is new to them because a mm-hmm. lot of these songs That's never true. really broke boundaries border wise so i mean at the- i mean stuff like working for the weekend or roller you know songs like that are, are pretty they transcend that kind of thing but yeah i mean a lot of the stuff was we always said wouldn't it be cool if somebody like in brazil said Man, that Lonely at Night song, which actually they has do. happened, by the way. I know, they do. Yeah. Somebody, for people in like Japan or someone go, I love that Lonely at Night song. And I go, well, that's awesome. That's, that's That was the whole thing for me was the motivation of trying to, you know, be curators of this music that we grew up loving, you know. Have you have you done two songs for uh, of one band yet? Yeah. Yes. A couple. Yeah, a yeah. couple, but not, not many. Done some Mostly Harlequin. Street Heart. Harlequin. It was good. We did, we did two did. Harlequin songs. We did two Street Heart songs. We did okay. two... Queen City Kids Queen songs. City Kids songs, yeah. I think yeah, that's and, it, right? And you did, uh, you did Alanis Morissette, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we did the Alanis Morissette song. That, that was that was smart. That was wise to get to get a, the gals in there too. Uh, <laughs> Atta Miles too. Did you do Atlanta Miles? We haven't done Atlanta Miles. That one, uh, Black Velvet comes up a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want to hear Todd singing that one. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder how she's doing because she had a terrible neck problem. Oh, oh yeah. Died. Yeah, she had some sort of health issue. Yeah, yeah. that's too bad. Yeah, that's too bad. So, what's it like playing with Harlequin? By the way, I got to ask that. That must be a blast taking the the kind of because as a as a singer myself, I'll step into something like Slash, and it's like uh, he does the singing. I don't have to even worry about that. Yeah, and then you step up. But I know that you guys have been doing like uh, Miracle and a, and a couple songs like that, even in the Harlequin show. That's got to be a yeah. blast. Yeah, we, yeah, we do some of, of our stuff. Uh, it's it's it's. I'm really glad that I joined. Um, when when they first asked me, I said no. Uh, I heard that. And then I uh, I started hanging out with um, with uh, Gottfried a bit more, and he's such a sweet man. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and uh, he kind of talked me into it, and I'm so glad. You know, I don't I don't want to play fifty, sixty shows a year. Uh, you know, I wouldn't want to do that. But they they were doing twenty a year. Right. And that's yeah. about perfect. And they're all fly in. There's no, you know, very, you know, maybe the Minidota Rock, Rock Festival, we drive there. But other than that, uh, uh, so it's usually one set and in and out. And uh, uh, I just love the guys in the band, the personality. They're all just awesome guys. And uh, and uh, I, I was honestly, I mean, I knew that they had hits, but I didn't realize they had so many hits that people all across Canada knew. Yeah. And so there's like half a dozen songs or maybe eight songs that everybody, doesn't matter where we are, they all know those songs and they all love them. So uh, it's cool. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. Because I was saying how, you know, my family's in, in BC, my wife's family's in Ontario. And in either visit, 
I will hear Harlequin songs. It's it's really fascinating. Yeah. You know, Thinking of You or Innocence will be played across the country. So not mm-hmm. not just I mean lots of Canadian music in general, but but it is and fascinating to see the far reaching of it. And to your point, Todd, about not having to sing that 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 I'm having so much fun just playing bass. It's, I know uh, it, it uh, takes the pressure away, doesn't it? Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. you jump around a lot more and uh, goof off a lot more and. Uh, but you do end up doing. They do end up showcasing you, whether you like it or not. For a couple, <laughs> where you want to just goof off, and they're like, "Nope, you're going to do Miracle." What else do you guys play, of your songs? We do Miracle and Success by the Pumps. Great. Nice. Great. That's a that's song. So we. Great. That's a song Tuke should cover. I played that miracle. song in. I Which played that success? song. In, yeah. yeah. I played that song as a kid too, man. But you had to play it because it had a, had a big f bomb in the middle of the song, so you knew that that yeah. was just yeah. like <laughs> right. that just shook the <laughs> room up. It. <laughs> played it before live. We we have played yeah. it. That's right. Yeah. Come on, it's... guys. What are you waiting for? What's, <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? What's the what's the scam? Hey, yeah, I wanted. To, I wanted. To, sorry. Go ahead. Are you making a? Are you guys working on a record or anything? Yes, we are. We are. We are. Look at this, guys. Want to see my pet? I do. Yeah. And I want to see your backyard again. Yeah, yeah. I want you to walk down to the water if when you get a second. All right. <laughs> that's what your husband said that's my awesome wife, my wife has a slew of chipmunks she's feeding I don't know if you can see this oh. hilarious oh. Wow. I thought you yeah I was worried there you just pointed at your crotch yeah. and said you want to see she's my pet beer, oh. beer. <laughs> <laughs> it's an adult show so adorable yeah. I don't see hey, a Chris, squirrel yeah, so, uh, hey since you moved to that beautiful uh, new newer house um, do you need to have a like a, a, a dedicated go to a studio to because you've had I've been to your studio downtown Winnipeg, which was awesome. That you know, like a vintage building. But do you still do that, or do you do you record at home? I record at home unless I'm doing drums. I can't do drums uh, in my place. Um, but uh, yeah, I love. Uh oh, is he oh, walking with his Wi-Fi? Yeah, fell into the lake. Hoping he's on on cell data. It's worth it. Let's see. Look, look at his view. Oh my God, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, See, kids, stay true to your dreams, and you can get waterfront property. <laughs> no, oh, that's really nice. What you can't see are the probably mosquitoes. losing the internet. Uh, this time of year up there is so beautiful too. I miss it. <clears throat> yeah, I know. Yeah, the river looks high. Yeah. It does look high. Is it ever flood? It is. It's pretty high at this time of year. Yeah, we've had uh, a bit of water, but. Uh, yeah, I'm so. I feel so lucky living here. I love uh, story. I love uh, going out in the woods. And, uh, I bike and stuff like that. Uh, and it's uh, very close. And uh, there's a lot of back roads and stuff with no traffic in it. So, uh, it's kind of like half. Fuck! I climb a hill. I'm huffing and puffing. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, it's half country, half city. It's great. That's great. And you have a chipmunk uh, rescue going on in your backyard. That's kind of yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Is there yeah. is there a house for sale next door? That's what I want to know. Wow. <laughs> it's We're like, all moving to Winnipeg. That was, uh, uh, it, it was uh, it was uh, sold about two or three years uh, two years ago. Uh, but the guys are the, our neighbors are just killer. They're so nice. That's uh, great. Wow. Hey, I wanted to ask about Steve McGovern. Yeah. Oh, this chipmunk's uh, really... Uh, okay, let's see chipmunks again. Steve yeah. McGovern is the guitar player. That's or is the guitar yeah, player. Stevie, uh, Stevie he moved back from Vancouver. He's living here in Winnipeg. He got married, uh, um, I guess, a few years ago, uh, two two years ago or something like that. Uh, he's doing great. I miss him. Uh, you know, we don't get to... We haven't played since... Uh, uh, it's been well, over a year now that we played. So, uh, I did, uh, uh, I did, a. my son got married and so to help him raise some money for us. So I played at a social and I got, uh, Stevie to come out and play. Um, and that was the last time I saw him. So that was, uh, in October, but, uh, he's doing well. Uh, That's okay. I have to tell you a story because right at the, I think it was in the, after the second record, maybe before the uh, the orphan record, that is, I was in a record store in Edmonton, you know, a young fledgling guitar player, and I see him working. At, it was like an 
what do they what do you call them? A and A or whatever those A&A records. records mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, and yeah, tapes. Yeah. And he, he and was. Tapes. <laughs> like, I think that's the guy from Orphan. He's working in a record store. So that that was my first like moment, aha moment, where I'm like, oh, you can be a rock star and not really be rich and famous. <laughs> that was your big aha moment about the music industry. Yeah. Totally. Exactly. Was that a happy moment or a sad one? <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was a, a question mark over my head moment where I'm like, wait a minute, maybe it, maybe you can't be rich and be a Canadian success story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's somewhat well, true. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, that's true in, in so many cases because the music business and show business is so fickle that like, you know, yeah. It's like you can have five good years and all of a sudden your time has, has run out. It's like when we talked about that whole Nirvana thing, there's a lot of people who had a massive career or a very good, you know, starting career that suddenly just went away. You know, it's like it, it's it's a funny business. Yeah. Well, it's funny. We were talking about Tom Cochran. Same thing. I mean, he was kind of here his whole career and then life is a highway. He took him here and then all of a sudden everybody thought he was a failure after that. And it was really just right back where he always was <laughs> yeah. you know you kind of mm-hmm. have your peaks and and you know that's just that's the well, it's nice having that kind of like uh life is a highway failure money in your bank account I guess. well <laughs> yeah. i wouldn't say that was the failure yeah. but i mean i, I mean <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... yeah that's that's a big song that's a really big song uh for oh, him they totally. covered somebody covered that song uh Rascal Rascal Flats. Flats. Yeah. yeah yeah for, the, for the cars movie so i just found bucky cromwell on spotify can you see that Okay, oh, cool. Cromwell. There you go. Oh, we'll there check he it out. is. Oh yeah, he looks pretty cool. That. Is that your is that your John Lennon self portrait? Yeah. I like it. Yeah. yeah that's that's uh yeah. I make all the videos too with iMovie and uh everything. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm trying to learn uh all that kind of uh stuff because uh I don't have a Darren. I, I gotta do it all myself. <laughs> now you do. Now you got a Darren. Well if there you need you somebody uh, to help produce though. Your guy is right there, Corey Churko. He's got he's got skills. Yes, he's got skills. Absolutely. I know. I I don't know if I can. It looks like you've got a big enough backyard for all. I of am us. cheap. <laughs> I am cheap. I'll play for a sandwich. There you go. I'll, pr- yeah. there you go. I'll work for a sandwich. <laughs> okay, you're on, man. You are. Okay. I would do. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to just uh, be able to say that you guys, you know, somebody from Tuke was playing on on the Bucky Cromwell record. I'd love that. There you go. Yeah. Are we keeping Somebody you from can. a recording session right now, Chris? Are you are you good? Or are, I'm sure you're, because you're you're right next to your studio, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, my studio is downstairs. I don't know. You probably got the studios are pretty boring. I'm sure you don't want to see it, but uh, yeah, it's right downstairs. Corey uh, salivating. I, uh, Corey salivating. <laughs> yeah. That's a that's a stupid question. Come on. Of course, we want to see your studio. I don't. I don't have a lot of shit. I I used to when I went to L. A. Matt Wallace. Uh, the producer, he's a, he was a gear nut, and he yeah. was telling me all about the Yuri compressors and the freaking Poltec EQs, and I bought a bunch of that stuff in L.A. and brought it all back. So I had all this vintage gear and stuff like that, and then, um, and then all the software started coming out, and uh, I, don't, I don't even have a mic pre anymore. Yeah. Uh, Everything I have is software. So when you look at my studio, you see two speakers and a yeah. computer screen. And that's pretty much it, and a few guitars. And I do have a, you know, like an ISO booth, uh, and I've been using uh, Cubase a lot, uh, which is uh, uh, like really great for MIDI. I'm, I'm a MIDI freak. Uh, I love programming. I uh, I hate drummers. Sorry, Brent. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a drummer. And Shane. Brent. Shane and I are no, yes. we're musicians. I would, I would, anything to get Brent uh, uh, on, a, on a, some tracks uh, so uh, so I'm pr- kind of self-sufficient I, I actually like it when I like producing solo artists because I don't I don't I don't want to even want to deal with bands that much if, if there's if they're country artists you know as you know I can sub out guys you know I got friends in Nashville I give them a hundred bucks and uh, you know they played on a million records right uh, mm-hmm. Uh, and so, and they just, they send it, I don't even have to record it. They just send me the file and, uh, it's usually freaking fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but I just recently got a Cubase endorsement, uh, because, uh, I wanted to upgrade and just, you know, the technical shit of upgrading, like my operating system did work, didn't work with this and this didn't talk to that, but I didn't want to give up my old system until I knew I could run the new system. 
and and Howard Klopak was helping me, and uh, he's like, man, that, they they should be able to just upgrade you. That 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 doesn't sound right. Uh, and so I I reached out to them and said, uh, I I want to upgrade, and I'm the most successful Cubase producer uh, producer in Canada. So can I have an endorsement? And I was just <laughs> I'll fling, and they said, yeah, <laughs> sweet, that's great. So, that's I have right. all the Cubase products, which is the thousand dollars worth of stuff, all their drums, all their waves, all oh, their. Oh, right on. Uh, so uh, now the challenge is learning how to work it. Mm -hmm. Of course. But uh, yeah, I'm having fun with it. Yeah. So just call them up. It's great to keep you out of trouble. Yeah. You just need one other Canadian think... there to verify it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, we won't keep you too much longer, Chris, because, uh, you know, we know you're a busy guy, but we wanted to thank you for coming on the show. Um, Are you kidding? My pleasure. And great to just uh, hang with you guys and get to know you all a bit better and stuff like that. Yeah, you too. absolutely. You too. So uh, everybody listening, uh, keep an eye out for things to come. And uh, if you enjoyed the show, again, send some stars. Who's, who's on next week? <laughs> that was awesome. Who's on next week? We want to get your chipmunk on next yeah, week. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, we, it's funny you say that. I know we got to go, but uh, you know, I'm thinking about stuff to to promote Bucky Cromwell online. I'm going. Well, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? I got nothing. And then I put it one one of my wife's chipmunks videos on, and it freaking explodes. Ah, <laughs> there you they go. They love the chipmunk. They don't love Bucky. <laughs> I know. Whatever sells. People love animals. Whatever sells. People like animals. They don't like music. Yeah. Just kidding. Yeah, we, uh, right, we're not guys. sure who's on next week, but stay tuned because, as always, we'll uh, let you know last minute. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, just in case, Chris, just hang out again uh, on the side, and we might get you back and do that studio tour. Sounds good, man. Sounds good. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. Okay. Peace All on. right. Take care. Thanks, Chris. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.